Imagine yourself on top of one World Trade Center on the 107th floor. Windows on the World Restaurant was one of the most magical places on Earth, not just in New York City. On a clear day, you could see 90 miles, planes flying below you. And 9.30, anybody in the restaurant business will tell you, is crunch time. I was walking the floor, and all of a sudden, I look to my right, and Brooklyn is not there anymore, OK? It's just, where did Brooklyn go? And then I, I quickly glance over. Queens is gone. It's blackout. There's, no, there's no, no lights whatsoever. And as soon as I get up to the window, we're overlooking Manhattan, downtown Manhattan, whoosh, lights go out for us. New York City is a vertical city. There are people in apartment houses that are 10 stories high. They don't have any water. They have no lights. And there is a sense of urgency. I stopped the car. And there was about four or 500 people in that park. And I told my partner, I said, we're not going down there. Let's get out of here. It wasn't just nighttime. It was total darkness. Everybody was kind of moving in groups. I'm sure they were scared, too. You know, because you don't know who's coming at you. It was like things had reached this boiling point. Once the lights went out, all hell broke loose. It's like an orgy of violence, arson, and insanity. How do you explain that social phenomenon? Hazy, hot, and humid. High in the daytime's up near 100 overnight. Lows down to around 80. A lot of fingers crossed with a continued heat wave. July 13, 1977. I was working my last four to 12 in a set of five. It was a beastly hot day. I distinctly remember it was horribly hot. The city's in the midst of a heat wave. Temperatures were routinely hitting 100, above 100. Around 6 o'clock, I headed home. I got home early enough that I got in the pool with the kids. Somewhere around 8 o'clock, it was clear that thunderstorms were going to move in. So we all got out. Latest weather advisory, severe thunderstorm warning in effect for all of Westchester County in New York. Now, these storms can produce wind gusts 50 miles an hour and more lightning, so be advised whatever precautions seem advisable. My daughter was brushing her teeth and looked out the bathroom window and said, what's wrong with the sky, Dad? It looks strange. I said, yeah, it's because of all the lightning. There's so much of it, it just stays lit. That evening, there was a lightning strike on a power line in Westchester County. The line went out, and the demand starts to increase on some of the surrounding lines. This sort of essentially sets off a kind of chain reaction, a sort of a domino effect, where another line suddenly has too much power, and it has to be shut down. And then another line is, is overextended, and it has to be shut down. Everyone's using a lot of power, because they're all running air conditioners. And before you know it, the city is struggling to get enough power into the five boroughs. I got a call, maybe a little bit after 9, asking me to call the system operator. I called in and finally said, there's no other choice. The only alternative was to disconnect customers. You, you know, you're going to lose the whole thing. Yeah, tell him it's a, it's a dire emergency. He can't give us any more to give it. Right. It is one man who is in charge of bringing all of this power in. 
You have people telling him, yelling at him, you have to shut down some of these lines. You have to do it or the city's going to lose power. Bill, I hate to bother you, but you better shed about 400 megawatts a load or you're going to lose everything down there. Yeah, I am trying to. Anyone who's ever flown into New York City at night, who's ever been in New York City at night, there are lights everywhere. It's a beautiful image, really, in a way. The city that never sleeps, the city where the lights are always on. I was playing handball with my friends. And you can still play at night because there was a lot of lampposts around Jefferson Park. But then all of a sudden, they started going out one by one. It's like, <sighs> and uh, we're like, wow, what's happening? That night, I'm on the third floor, windows open. It was very hot. So people were outside, and suddenly the TV went off. The light went off. All of a sudden, the noise outside in the street quickly stopped for a second, and suddenly you heard a <gasps> Because everybody at the same time realized something had happened. I was up in the office. I was catching up on some paperwork and uh, having a cup of coffee, and the lights dimmed. The emergency generator roared on, and somebody shouted, blackout, you know? One of the things about Windows on the world right from the very beginning was its dress code. You had to have a jacket and tie. The general manager said to me, you can tell people they can take their jackets off. Take their jackets off, you know? OK, you can take your jackets off. Next thing, the ties are coming off. Next thing, you know, people loosening their shirts. The general manager got up and immediately spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody's getting champagne. Now, direct from CBS News, this special Radio Net Alert news report. A major power blackout has hit New York City and surrounding communities. Chuck, if you could, what can you tell us about the feel for Midtown Manhattan? Well, George, there are people directing traffic at the intersections. I assume many of them are policemen. Uh, some of them, uh, obviously, are just volunteers, people who wanted to pitch in. But in general, people are taking it in good spirit and uh, almost a little conviviality going on. Ready to see the music hall. What sure. happened to the music hall? All of a sudden, lights went out. <laughs> and uh, no picture, no sound, nothing. And uh, the man made an announcement about uh, the power was off in the whole city. And you're waiting for the subway now? No, there's no subway running. So what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm on TV. You're on TV. All I can tell you is there was a severe electrical storm to the north. Lights totally went out about 15 minutes ago. All five boroughs are affected, so that's the word. Seven million people are now without power. My beat at the post was covering politics. I went running over to City Hall, and I spent the night in the command center where we got regular briefings on what they said was going on in the city. The blackout was not the city's fault, but um, it was an opportunity for the mayor, A. Beam, to show the people of New York that he was in control. What are you doing out of this area? We're trying to keep on top through every agency of the city to uh, uh, do everything possible to uh, keep things moving. 
and uh, keep people alerted and have the people who are with city agencies uh, uh, at their stations in case they're needed. I'm not sure to this day if he or even the police commissioner actually knew what was going on because if they did, they didn't tell us. I'm trying to scramble you know, to find out what the big issues are. I call up the five battalions, seeing how things are in their district, the phones were evidently working. And I told them, hey, we got to go down to those subways, make sure those people stuck in those hot trains don't bail out on those third rail tracks. And then we have these portable generators that are useful. You know, hospitals, that's our first priority. At Bellevue, the city's largest hospital, emergency generator service, has been halted by an electrical fire. Steps are being taken to protect the lives of patients, respirators, and other necessary electrical equipment. Dr. Stephen Schwartz at New York's Lenox Hospital says emergency equipment is working there, but they're bracing for a possible flood of patients. Then, you know, I got called to go respond to a fire, and I never returned to the fires. I knew this was going to be a very uh, difficult and challenging task to put the power system back together. It's really not made to shut down and restart. It's made to stay in service. We knew this was going to be a long, drawn-out affair. The restoration plan was out of date because it hadn't been updated since 1965. So between Shai and I, we made up the plan. Well, there's only two ways to restore the power. One is to bootstrap the system up on its own or to bring power in from the outside. We both knew that the quickest, fastest way was to get power in from the outside. I said, I'll take the part from the north. Jack, you take the part from the Long Island Lighting. And uh, at some point, we're going to meet in the middle. And so far as police are concerned, all off-duty police officers are being ordered to their nearest precinct. Not the precinct uh, where they work, but the precinct of residence. We didn't know it was a big blackout. The lights went out. But who knew if the lights were going to stay out? There was no AM, FM radios in the patrol cars at the time. So you had no radio communication with the outside. Our portable radio had died because the repeat is being out. Well, we go back into the station house. And when we went into the station house, that's when we really knew that the pot was cooking. Station house was in darkness, complete and utter darkness. Everybody's walking around with flashlights, some candles, and it looked like uh, a cross between a Boris Karloff movie and uh, Car 54. The sergeant said, go out, do the best you can. Come back in a little while. We're going to have a better plan in place. But go out and do what you can do. Twelve years earlier, November 1965, New York City lost its power, and it was a very startling event. But. All in all, the city handled it remarkably well. You know, the urban legend was that nine months later, you know, births spiked in the city. I don't know if that's actually true, but I think that captivated the sense that most people had of almost a kind of moment out of the ordinary, but not a scary or threatening experience. I remember the, the blackout of 65 as almost being fun. There was a certain festive atmosphere People pull together. Um, there were little get togethers on the streets. Had a bright moon. Everything was peaceful. We were directing traffic, and then we had everybody else to start directing traffic with us. 
people became helpful to each other, and it went very, very smoothly. The blackout in 1965 happened at 5.30, so the store owners were still in their stores locking up. The temperature was uh, between 43 and 48 degrees, right? So people were not out on the street. A lot of people simply stay in their houses. There was no real sense of panic. There was no increase in crime. In the end, really no big deal. New York had been this great kind of working class city. You could come to New York, immigrants obviously from around the world, you could find a job, you could make a better life. Through the mid-1960s, New York was doing pretty well economically. It was both a financial center, it was a huge manufacturing center. You see blue collar workers all over the place. You would see factories making garments, making electronic goods. You see people uh, working, unloading ships on the docks. New York was historically a city that did take care of people, where the subways were heavily subsidized, where you had great public schools, where you had this fantastic network of universities that were free. And by 1977, I mean, all of this was just such a distant memory. The ambitions of the city had diminished so greatly, and this, this notion that the city could take care of the people who lived in it uh, was, was, was gone. Treasury Secretary Simon said today that the country is in a recession. For the first time since 1941, the nation's unemployment rate has gone above 9%. In New York City, the rate of unemployment is much higher than it is nationally, higher than at any time since the Great Depression. The 1970s was an economically troubled period for the whole United States, and New York was particularly hard hit by this general turn downward. New York hits a 12% unemployment rate in 1975. That's just a huge unemployment rate, and you can feel it all over, every place. It's visceral. People hang out on the streets, increase in petty crime, a sense of despair in a lot of areas, you know, of giving up. There was this sense that there were no jobs in New York. People were fleeing the city, moving to the suburbs if they could. Some of the middle class white families move out. What became known as white flight. There was just sort of a sense of desperation about New York at the time. The city will need more than God's help to get out of this mess. New York needs $500 million a month to keep its head above water. In 1975, New York City was on the brink of bankruptcy, and it needed a loan from Washington. And President Ford gave it some thought and came back to New York and said, you're not going to get a loan. After very uh, dramatically turning down uh, a city request, there was a retreat in Washington from that hard line. But they would only give New York City the money it needed to avoid bankruptcy if New York City adopted austerity measures. That meant cutting public services, laying off tens of thousands of workers, and other kinds of measures that assured them that they would get that money back. When those layoffs of police and firefighters came, you know, we were shocked. And that was sort of like a, a little unwritten social contract that was broken by the city. The police went on strike, the fire went on strike, sanitation went on strike. This big cut in public services at a time when the private economy is in very bad shape. 
means hardship. They had immediate impact on New Yorkers and particularly on poor New Yorkers. People can't send the kids off the streets into the library. It's not there anymore. They can't send them to the after-school athletic program to keep them safe. It's not there anymore. So there's a lot of anger and also, I think, a sense of uh, abandonment. Graffiti, crime, drugs, uh, homeless people, squeegee people. People would put in their car windows, no radio, so people wouldn't break their windows. So it was, the city was, was going down. When a population is neglected for so long, and then they keep cutting your social services, your education, your hospitals, your fire departments, it's gonna boil. And sooner or later, something's gonna come out of that. And it wasn't going to be pretty. This is the Bronx in New York. One and a half million people live in this borough. It's the home of the New York Yankees. It has also become the arson capital of the world. Once that smoke on the horizon signified industry, progress, jobs, now it means someone is burning down a building. We call those years the fire, years when the city was burning down. When I come in the fire service, a busy fire company did 1,700 to 2,000 runs a year. In the 1970s, we were all doing 5,000 alarms a year. Smoking, carelessness, falling asleep with a cigarette, cooking fires, and electrical fires. They were the three top causes. We have fire on a fifth floor in a popping flyby. But then there was arson. Arson for profit, arson for revenge. You wanted to get even to a neighbor. You had arson for fun. A couple of kids with a can of gasoline could light a vacant building and have a ball watching firefighters come with big aerial ladders and a night, hot night, and uh, we'd watch us throw water into this building. You had fires for boredom. The block below me, of the 60 houses, maybe only five of them hadn't had a fire. You knew that there's a chance that your house could catch on fire. So it caused that next person next door to move. Now that landlord didn't get his rent. This led to the temptation for some people to consider burning the building and collecting the insurance. And it became a domino effect. On top of all that, there was a serial killer on the loose in New York. In New York, the search continues for the son of Sam, the object of one of the biggest manhunts in this city's history. The killer has taunted authorities by writing two letters, signed, Son of Sam. The NYPD was then and still is the preeminent police department in the country, and he was eluding the NYPD. Everybody was very tense, and it contributed to the sense of nobody was in control. It was becoming embarrassing to say you were a New Yorker after having been so many years when you were proud to be a New Yorker. The city was falling apart. By 10 o'clock, that's when I started to hear the noises. And first my mother goes, what is that? You heard these bumping noises. Just bump, 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 bump outside. And so my mother opens the door and she looks and I stick my head out. And the staircase door was open a little bit and you see a washing machine going up the stairs. Then after that, a refrigerator comes upstairs. 
Then those giant furniture TVs, you know, the old Zeniths with the, the sound system in and the record player, those started going up. And it was just box after box after box after box. It just happened, like a tinderbox. It went from being lights to being looting. All I remember was people with stuff, coats, clothes, like people just have this stuff draped over their arms, like, yo, you want to buy this? You want to buy that? They stole clothes, electronics, uh, just everything you could think of. It happened within minutes in all these neighborhoods. Every single borough in New York was affected by the looting. And it happens, I mean, just instantaneously. Ace Pontiac stored 50 brand new Pontiacs in its garage. And the, uh, and the fire department had a rule that if you stored cars in, inside a building, you had to leave the key in the ignition and you had to put $2 worth of gas in the tank. Well, all 50 of these cars vanished uh, in, the, in, in the first hour and a half. There was people everywhere, hundreds, hundreds per block. We responded to a call for assistance from Wyckoff Heights Hospital. And the staff in the emergency room was being hard pressed to keep up with the injuries because the looters were suffering such vicious cuts from the glass. There was blood everywhere. There was people with some hellacious injuries. And it really was starting to slide. I was in medical school. So, you know, I figured I might as well just go and work at the hospital. It was packed, full-blown people outside in the street waiting to get in. I went in, and there were some doctors there. And I explained that I was a medical student. And he asked me, had I sutured before? And I said, well, I'd done a little bit, but not really. He said, okay, come, come, I'll show you. We need your help, we need your help. All night long, I was in a corner just closing up wounds. had our store, which was entitled Trophies by Sill. It was a sporting goods and trophy shop. We thought of it as more than a store. We taught the young people how to open a bank account, how to fill out the forms. Uh, my husband would go with them, show them how to do that. That evening, the lights went out as we were eating. And my husband said, oh, maybe we better get back over there. And I said to him, well, let me, let me do the dishes first. <laughs> I probably lost about an hour. When we got to maybe five, six blocks away from our store, we started seeing our merchandise in the street. I just drove up on the sidewalk and I parked the car directly where the doorway was. The people who were inside, when they saw my husband, they said, here's Mr. Sill, Mr. Sill is here, and they started running. It was sad in some ways because some people that you saw would be people you would not have expected to see in that capacity, and, uh, and yet they were there. And I figured, okay, I'll walk over to the store, and I saw a crowd on the side of the store. They were pushing and shoving to get into the store, and people were coming out carrying things. 
They got out hi-fi, they got out TVs. The store next to me, the owner came over to me and, and he says, I'm shooting in the air to scare them away. He said, you need a gun. I said, no way. I said, I'll get hurt if I have a gun. I couldn't do anything about it, so I just was watching. And then my knee started to shake. We had to stay there all night because if we left, they were going to come in and take the rest. There was no police to stop them. Uh, who, who would stop them from taking whatever else was there? One problem with the police is they were told to report to the nearest precinct to them. Almost none of them live in the affected precincts, in the poor neighborhoods. The major looting occurred when there were uh, almost no policemen on the street. It took hours to get cops to the neighborhoods that needed them most. By the time they get there, this thing is, this thing is on. There were a lot of uh, merchants and people who wanted police to come to their stores, stand there with their rifles in their hands and, and keep, the, keep the people out. Well, the police didn't have anywhere near the manpower or police power to do that. The whole Bronx is going, man. The whole Bronx is going. You know, we'd like to sit here and watch it. No, it's all right. Our instructions were do the best you can. And we did the best we could. We had sticks, we had our hands. We'd grab people and just toss them out. We were so outnumbered, we'd push them back as far as we could. The people would only respond so far. And then they would start hurling rocks and bottles at us. And then it was a pitch battle in the street. After a while, it was, what can you do? It was insanity. It's 12.02 on WABC in New York. We switch now to Steve O'Brien. Thank you, George. Walking into one of the neighborhood uh, establishments, we found uh, uh, still an atmosphere of, uh, <laughs> of extreme levity considering the situation. Anyway, people are feeling uh, no pain in most of the establishments around the area. The lights went out and the beer came out and with candles and, uh, and we had a block party. I didn't find out until the next day <laughs> that there was any looting. Right? I mean, if you didn't live on a commercial street, you didn't know the looting had happened. We were on an island in the sky, isolated from whatever else was happening in all of New York City. We had these emergency lights, but it wasn't enough. I mean, uh, so we, we started bringing candles in. In, in. in hindsight, I don't think that was a good idea because the candles also gave off heat. Air conditioning now has been out for, uh, since 9.30. Uh, and, um, but still, uh, people, some people, we had to ask to leave, <laughs> that kind of thing, you know. They liked the champagne part. Sort of sounds like the Titanic when, when we talk about did the band play on, you know. We had a three-piece uh, uh, combo of piano, bass, and guitar. The piano continued on. It's the city of rich and the city of the poor. And if you weren't in one of those neighborhoods, you know, if you were on the Upper East Side, enjoying a candlelit dinner on your roof. You had no idea what was going on all around you.
George, I just had a Con Ed spokesman on the phone to see if we can get a better idea of when Con Ed will be restoring that power. Here's Ed Livingston right now. We can't, uh, really can't estimate that. We're working as hard as we can uh, and as fast as we can. But I, I don't want to build up any hopes and, and pick a number of hours because we just can't be sure right now. We were moving in a step-by-step, -step, very methodic, uh, logical way of picking up the load. The generation was coming on slowly. I'm busy concentrating, and I turn around, and there's the chairman of the board and, and the, uh, the president of the company. They just wanted me to proceed with a sense of urgency, which we were. Each time we came to a point where we could pick up another network, it took about 15 minutes. That doesn't seem like a lot of time when you're talking one network, but when you have 15 networks, it's a lot of time. Electricity is a kind of a keystone for civility. And if we can get the street lights back on, the traffic lights working and all that kind of thing, you, there's a much better uh, likelihood that the police and so forth can, can maintain control. first group who went into the stores 10 minutes after the blackout occurred. These were a criminal element. Then the stores were open. And then another class of looters came in, people who did not have a criminal background, whom it would not occur to to go and smash the window of a store and go in and grab something. But they sat in their hot apartments, seeing people run in and grab stuff, and they said, you know, I could really use some pampers. I remember the rattling. It's a very distinct rattling. A whole bunch of housewives had looted the supermarket at the corner where I used to live. And what they had done is they had taken pantyhose and they had tied shopping carts together so they can make a shopping cart train. And then they had loaded all the stuff, all this merchandise, pampers, toilet paper, food, on these carts and were pushing them home. These were the people who tended to get arrested. They had never been arrested before. And here they were arrested and charged with stealing a couch or some clothes. There were uh, not a package of Pampers survived the looting. Anybody and everybody, children, women, men, people with jobs, people without jobs, they all got caught up in the moment. They didn't feel like they were committing a crime because the whole general atmosphere, the whole feeling of it was Everybody's doing it. Why not me? Was it the looting? Looting, looting, looting. Looting is a complicated thing. People do it because they're greedy, because uh, they need stuff. It's also sometimes fun. It's the people on the bottom being on the top for a moment. And they know it's only for a moment, but who's going to stop it? Who's going to stop it? No one can stop it. That, that can be a thrill. It was the neighborhoods that had been neglected that rioted. And it was basically people who were poor and hungry. The media paints it a look at these criminals. It's race, but it's not so much race as it is class. Black people didn't go after white people. Latinos did not go after the Italians. It was more about class. We didn't have, so we went, not even, after, not even after those who had, we went after their stuff. It's an expression of anger, it's an expression of neglect, and it's an expression of need. If you don't control the crime problem and the people 
causing the disorder, it becomes a fire problem. The dispatcher ordered us to go from fire to fire. You were driving in the streets. People were waving to you for help. You couldn't stop. Buildings were burning. Cars in the street were burning. Garbage in lots were burning. You know, you'd hear the dispatcher, no companies available, no companies available. They would only send us to big store fires. You know, we would go to these big supermarket fires, appliance store fires, which were being broken into, uh, looted, and burned. Not only did they loot the stores, they burnt them. And, and to me, that was the ultimate uh, violation. You took everything, now why are you gonna burn the store down as well? Fire is a special effect. You light a car, you got a spectacular event. Fire, you know, it's got noise, it's got smoke, it's got flame, it's got sound. It was a crazy scene, you know, it was something out of like a world war. New York City in the early morning, after a night of no electric power, and so no lights, elevators, subway trains, or any trains, airports, air conditioning, traffic signals, television. What it did have in the dark streets was a wild outburst of crime. Arson, looting, mugging, and a thousand false fire alarms. After the blackout, everyone is trying to make sense of what has happened to New York. There was this sense that New York is not just in financial trouble, not just struggling, but there's something really existentially, foundationally wrong with New York. And New York is in real, real trouble. When we got up that next day, I got on my bike and rode around the neighborhood and you just saw it. everything was gone. And that's when it kind of sunk in that nothing's going to be the same. You know, nothing's ever going to be the same. And you just go, so what are people supposed to do now? You know? It sort of felt like uh, some bomb had gone off, but instead of destroying the buildings, all you had was a whole bunch of of confetti and paper. And it was a very quiet city. And I think that one of the reasons for this quietness was because a lot of frustration had been released. And even if you yourself had not gone out there to loot, others had. And somehow, I think, that brings you some sort of catharsis. Once the sun was up, the stones were now there. Many of them had roots in the neighborhood and were actually connected to the neighborhood. So they were hurt and we were hurt. Take out everything, I lost all my money. I worked about 10 years for this. I lost everything. It's like, it's like, I don't have no issue, no nothing. I have three kids, one wife, I lost everything. You got these people now, they, they're worried about their business as to whether they can start again in a community like this. Uh, as to whether they're gonna trust these people around here, I doubt it. The merchants, they're not gonna trust these people after this. I wouldn't trust them. So yourself, what are you gonna do now? Well, I tell you, I'm gonna leave, uh, leave this great big apple to those that wanna stay here. I can't, I can't fight this anymore. <laughs> Early the next morning, and I walk into the store, and the lights were still out, but there's enough light for me to see where I'm going. It was horrendous. It was a lot of work. 
it was going to be no guarantee that we could make it, more to cut out all the questions, not any major statement. I just put a sign on the window that said, we're staying. They had taken so much. We, we lost, um, I think it was something like $350,000 worth of merchandise. My whole thought was, how am I going to stay in business? My husband, he just sat down with people who looted the store, talked to them, uh, told them he was disappointed. But he never reacted in such a way that would have been a, a negative on his part. You know, I, now that was something I could not do. I could not sit down and look a person in the eye and say, it's okay, it was not okay. No matter how long we stayed, the store never really was what it had been all those years ago. My neighborhood stayed that way for probably 15 years. That whole strip never opened back up, ever again. Everybody that lived there, those mom and pop stores, they just shut down and they left. We got finished at about 8 in the morning. I just, I sat on the hood of the car and looked down Broadway. I said, I think the neighborhood's done. I think the back has finally been broken. And it was. I truly believe that that night took the carpet out from under the people. What triggered the blackout? A federal report places the primary blame on Consolidated Edison, saying it was unprepared to deal with the crisis touched off by a severe thunderstorm. A blackout is almost similar to an airplane crash. It's never just one item. From the first lightning strike to the complete system shutdown, it's a series of events that if any one of them didn't occur, or was responded to differently would have prevented the Black Hill. It was a night of terror that lasted for 25 hours. What happened to this blinded city? 3,176 people arrested, 132 policemen injured, 1,576 businesses looted or set on fire. The blackout produced the largest mass arrest in the city's history. We're talking about thousands of people. And we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of damage and stolen property. There were a thousand major fires that night. One thousand major fires. I mean, that's, that's mind boggling. There's a social order that's necessary to live in these dense urban areas and that broke down that night. But in the worst slums of the city, the light of mindless violence lit up the sky as the blackout divided the town into two societies, separate and unequal. The blackout gave you appreciation of the fragility of urban life. You flip the switch and darkness turns to light, you know, and you just totally take all the stuff for granted. And an event like that makes you realize how contingent, you know, how, how fragile all that is. You can't hit your mom because she's your mom, so you hit your little brother. Something like that is what was happening. You couldn't go after these politicians that were killing your neighborhood. So you went after your little brother. You went after each other. If you wanted to say, when was the bottom of the decaying, declining New York City, you would have to say 1977, the blackout. 
We've had some very good, prosperous times in New York City since then. But this is always there as an example of uh, what could happen.